This meeting is being recorded. Hi, everyone. Uh, we're going to get started in just a few moments. Thanks for being patient for us to uh, get the meeting kicked off. We're just seeing participants roll in. Um, as we uh, see folks joining, I just wanted to um, firstly say I'm so glad that so many have registered for this for tonight. Uh, I believe we've had over uh, 75 registrants and growing. Um, so we're looking forward to a wonderful evening. My name is Frank Moses. I'm the executive director of the Skinny Atlas Lake Association. And uh, before we get into uh, tonight's presentation, I did want to just make a couple of housekeeping announcements. Uh, we are all muted uh, this evening, uh, and but we do have, uh, you should see this uh, little insignia that says Q&A, and that's the button we'll be using. Um, I think that's the same uh, uh, Q&A you'll be looking for if you're on a mobile device, if you're um, zooming in through, uh, through a device like that, or, on, or if you're on your computer, it should be at the bottom of your screen. Uh, so any questions for our presenters this mm -hmm. evening, or general questions about lake friendly living, please use that. Uh, there is a chat option too. If there's any general comments, we'll also see if we can, uh, as we go, load up any uh, links and different resources. Uh, the um, presentation is being recorded, so we're looking forward to uh, uh, sending that along and distributing uh, to uh, our, our, uh, our networks. Uh, I did want to thank Molly Newman, uh, who's online this evening, along with, I'm sure, a lot of our, our host organization volunteers and staff. Uh, Molly's with the, she's a program associate with the Cuga Lake Watershed Network, uh, who's hosting tonight's Zoom session. Uh, so thanks, Molly, for being here. Molly's also going to be helping at the end with uh, moderating questions and making sure we don't miss any anything coming down the pike. Uh, again, thanks to all of our Lake Friendly Living Coalition of the Finger Lakes host organizations. Uh, this is the first year, this is our third year of uh, Lake Friendly Living Awareness. Um, and this year we've had uh, various impact events throughout uh, the Finger Lakes and a couple of these online events. Uh, in 2021 and 2022, we had a lot of online webinars. Uh, which you can uh, go to the website that we'll put up uh, to see a lot of those historic webinars. Um, and so we're excited about this being our third year and, and having our keynotes this, this evening. Uh, this Again, this is the third annual Lake Friendly Living Awareness Month. Uh, and the 2023 Lake Friendly Living uh, Awareness Month focuses on making an impact, empowering, inspiring communities to take action to preserve and protect our greatest natural resource, the Finger Lakes. Um, this is actually the first year where we have representation from all 11 Finger Lakes with uh, Rob Holland uh, from Hemlock and Canadice Lake uh, joining the group this year. Uh, so many great uh, volunteers and staff and folks that have made this, made this possible. We uh, saw a reason that we had a lot of cross-cutting programs uh, to be under the same banner uh, for these uh, initiatives that uh, to help reduce threats uh, that all of our Finger Lakes are facing. So uh, thanks for participating uh, tonight. I will, this uh, is the pledge uh, um, slide that was really what started the program where we saw, um, I believe Seneca and uh, Canandaigua Lake uh, started these, these pledges and these signs and uh, it kind of grew from there. And uh, we've all uh, adopted different pledges that you can find uh, through the Finger Lakes Regional Watershed Alliance website that I'll post up um, and a lot of other resources. But basically the pledge is to uh, say that you're gonna make, uh, make some choices to be more uh, lake friendly in, in your daily lives. Uh, so this is, I'll put this in the chat, uh, but the Finger Lakes Regional Watershed Alliance is our host organization where the initiative was officially adopted uh, under the umbrella of FLRWA or the Alliance. Uh, so many thanks to their leadership, especially Margie Creamer, who's their president at the moment. Um, and uh, Margie's also affiliated with Atisco Lake where this photo's from and has been a great leader uh, and, and everybody throughout the, from all over the lake <clears throat> has really risen to the occasion um, in promoting these uh, 
these different programs and opportunities to engage our, our lake communities. Um, so without further ado, I wanted to introduce, uh, unless Molly, did I miss anything? Um, okay, great. Um, so I did want to introduce our speakers this evening. Uh, Dr. Don Leopold, who's a distinguished teaching professor in the Department of Environmental and Forest Biology at the SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry. Uh, Don is also the co-director of the Restoration Science Center, which he'll be speaking about this evening. And then also Sam Quinn, who's the coordinator of the Conservation on Private Lands Initiative with the Restoration Science Center at SUNY ESF, also uh, working closely on the lawn to meadows. Um, Dr. Leopold uh, was my dendrology professor uh, way back in the day during undergrad years. Um, and have in, I've enjoyed uh, many, many different occasions and experiences with Don through the years, including bio blitzes on Onondaga Lake, uh, some bourbon tasting, which maybe Don can talk about uh, another time too. Um, and then also meeting Sam uh, in recent years uh, through this initiative, uh, Sam and Don and the whole Restoration Science Center team on this left photo, this is uh, Brandy Neveldine on, on the left. Uh, she's in the development office, uh, keeping the, the program going, uh, working on different uh, development initiatives uh, with the program, getting off the ground, uh, getting garnering support from Central, Community, Central New York Community Foundation, which actually helped pay for some plantings. Uh, Dr. Dana Hall, our chair of our Watershed Improvement Project Committee, and here's Don in the center. And um, along the line is Dr. Neil Murphy on our SLA board and the current president, uh, Joni Mahoney. Uh, and then Sam, all of this <clears throat> Dowling Creek uh, project that um, the Lake Association uh, put on as far as an improvement project, a stream stabilization project. Uh, since that you know, these relationships working with Sam and Don, uh, we received a, a request to see if uh, the SLA was interested and we are very much interested because all these improvements help uh, the water quality for city of Syracuse and ESF. Uh, so we yeah. want to keep ESF involved in helping uh, improve water quality for the only, their own drinking water back at campus. Um, but we, um, received a request to keep help keep the program running uh, this year and develop a partnership uh, with the Restoration Science Center. And our leadership had, uh, this is our first announcement of our leadership committed $75,000 uh, for this year and for the efforts in, as a one-to-one -one match for what the Restoration Science Center is doing uh, with, these, with the uh, Conservation on Private Lands Initiative. Uh, so thanks so much, Don and Sam. We're excited to continue working with you and, and uh, work on some more details for the future. Uh, the, the floor is all yours. Thanks everyone for joining us this evening. Right. <clears throat> well, thanks, Frank. And, and thanks for facilitating our uh, collaboration with you. Um, and especially more recently for uh, some of the financial support you're providing. Uh, the, the RSC, the Restoration Science Center, is a group of faculty, staff, and st students. It's a fairly recent um, gathering at uh, ESF. We have all these folks who are working on restoration projects all over the state and country and the world, and, and there wasn't an umbrella to capture those efforts, and so we put together an umbrella where parts of it have been very successful uh, because of the various themes and a few things have really taken off. Uh, as Frank uh, may have suggested, the, the Restoration Science Center is run entirely by philanthropic funds and uh, donations from people. And for some of the projects, just outright large uh, grants. We are starting a project any day now looking at the biodiversity on right-of-ways on both sides of the lower Hudson River a real exciting project uh, funded for about $800,000 by utility companies. And what that funding does, it allows us to pursue some interesting research questions, but also to hire students who someday, some of them will be scientists and teachers and, and others. And this summer, we've got quite the army because of various sources of funding and various projects. And 
And one of the many things that Sam does is, is manages all those people. And it's not probably as easy as it, as it sounds. The Restoration Science Center is really focused on restoring rare plant and animal species, uh, natural communities, and pollinator-rich habitats. And another project that we've gotten substantial funding for is for our uh, forest food systems, where we're trying to implement a uh, multi-layered forest on abandoned urban plots that will produce food that people can have. They can go out and pick them. And some of that food you've probably have heard of like pawpaws and some of it maybe you haven't, but there's 1800 abandoned parcels in Syracuse. They're not ecologically functional. So let's restore those. So the restoration isn't always for as it used to be. Sometimes it's for the best possible use for that property. Uh, one program that's really been active is the Conservation on Private Lands Initiative. And within that, the program that is just uh, really takes up a lot of time and Sam has managed so well is our Lawn to Meadow program. It make, makes sense. Uh, the timing couldn't be better. 20 years ago before HABs uh, were in the news on the Finger Lakes, you know, people would have just sort of been maybe nonchalant, but they're real, they're serious, and there aren't many really practical ways to, to, to address those problems. We think the Londa Meadow program um, is, is the best way without really elaborate, expensive engineering solutions. Uh, we couldn't do this work without talented students and staff, and we have a lot, but Sam is the key uh, Sam has two degrees in conservation biology from ESF, and then he went to work for a, a farm in Northern Virginia who wanted him as a conservation biologist to maximize production, but not at the expense of biodiversity. And that's a pretty unusual idea among uh, farmers and, and large farms. And he did a good job at that. Uh, we got some money to open up a research scientist position to run our private lands program, which he applied to. Uh, we hired him. He was the only applicant, but still he was the best by far. And um, he's just really taken off and has been responsible for us bringing in literally millions of dollars of funding from various sources. Uh, his, it's, it's kind of been fun working with him because I knew him as an undergrad and, and grad student, and he was really sort of focused on herps. And it's, it's just so neat to see someone realize that all the little pieces besides herps are also important. And he's uh, one of the, our best naturalists probably at the uh, college. Uh, so as a research assistant, he basically manages our programs and hires many talented students, some of whom have gone on to bigger and better things and some of whom are working for us this summer. So it's been, it's been a real pleasure having Sam on board and he's been highly effective and many of you have, I think, worked with him. So I'll turn the program over to Sam and uh, I'll stay on for questions at the end as well in case anything comes up. You're gonna make me blush. That was a really nice introduction. So um, Don was my teacher for half of my life <laughs> and I appreciate the compliment on um, my skills as a naturalist, but we were at a site, which we won't name because it's a protected area. And I almost stepped on one of the rarest plants in New York before Don stopped me earlier today. So I still got a little ways to go. But today I'm going to talk about Lawn to Meadow. It is one of these things that's so popular in the media right now. It's no mo May. There's great interest in it. And what ESF and its Restoration Science Center does, our goal is not to just plant some native wildflowers and say, yeah, lawn to meadow. It is to restore functioning ecosystems to get the most value for protecting water quality and protecting biodiversity and enhancing the landscape, whether it's by sequestering carbon or, or just beautifying things. So um, that's really what we bring to the table. And I'm not going to talk and this square, I'm going to show you beautiful pictures of meadows. They're just taking a while to load, so I'm playing for time. My internet's being a little slow today. Any any sec now, they're going to open up. So um, Don already did the hard work of introducing the Restoration Science Center. I'll just say that um, as the person who kind of coordinates the Conservation on Private Lands initiative within that center, I've been here for, uh, geez, this is my seventh year. 
And I was a student at ESF too, and my heart is really in central New York. So uh, it's a pleasure to speak to you all. I'm so honored that the Skinny Atlas Lake Association has invited us to talk today and has partnered with us um, so importantly this summer and supported us financially. And thanks to Molly for organizing all of this. Um, you'd think I'd be better at Zoom with all the teaching we did during COVID, but so here we go. Um, I believe my screen's loaded now. So you're going to see today uh, some photos. I'm going to try and keep this relatively brief. Normally I talk for hours and hours, but I'd like to leave a lot of time for questions. And what I want to do is talk about the state of the, the uh, Lawn to Meadow program today and show some photos of meadows that we've created in the region and show them through time, have they, how they have evolved, how they have changed through seasons and uh, show you photos of more mature meadows that I've created or, and or managed to give you an idea of how diverse these systems could be. Um, before I start though, I wanna talk importantly about this word I keep using, restore. And I wanna be clear that when, as, as a conservation biologist, when I say the word restore, it can mean many things. And people often assume it means to uh, transition a plant community back to some historic reference state, either pre-settlers or pre-humans at all. And that's not really what we're doing with Lawn to Meadow. So the Restoration Science Center broadly works on restoring some of the rarest, most complex plant communities and ecosystems on the planet. And Meadows are not exactly that in this context. Um, we are creating assemblages of plants to meet objectives, not to replicate a historic environment. Of course, these plants are native to uh, North America. Not all of them are native to New York State. Um, part of what we do is to plan for the future, to uh, address the objectives of today, like protecting water quality by using these plant combinations to do this work in creative ways. And also to meet landowner goals. Much of the work we do is on private land, private properties, and people have legitimate concerns about vegetation height and the appearance of their their plants and maybe what color flowers they like and all that. So it's a complex business, but any of you very educated folks listening, when I say the word restore and you see photos of combinations of plants that you'd never see in nature, um, even though they're native, just being clear, we're building to solve ecological problems. And so um, I can't start without thanking our many partners, especially the Skinny Atlas Lake Association, who is... Uh, not only financially supporting us, but in terms of communications and meeting people and networking with you all, our invaluable partners, and the Central New York Community Foundation, who funded our work for a couple of years before this year and allowed us to do all of this, and Go Native Perennials, where we have one of or a couple demonstration meadows, uh, a local nursery and uh, wonderful partners as well, and, and many others that you know, I don't have time to go through all of them, but so many people are interested in this topic and it's a real pleasure to be part of it. Now, before I get into talking about Meadows, I want you to know we have developed, our, well, our students have developed tons of information for you all. It's free, you can, uh, you can access it on our website, on our YouTube page, which I'll show you in a moment. This is one example of, uh, something that a student, Shubati, created a couple of years ago. It's a pocket guide for lawn to meadow conversion specific to central New York. And the reason this is valuable is that there are many guides out there on lawn to meadow conversion or establishing and maintaining meadows, but they're so general um, that they're they're often not good enough for uh, people in specific locations that are worried about the weeds they might see in central New York or the types of meadow plants that are most appropriate here or how plants that grow all over the country tend to do in central New York. So we thought this slightly more um, specific guide would be really valuable to folks. And you can access it digitally on the RSC's website. And there's a little QR code thing that one of our very intelligent students made that um, uh, I love having students that can do all these things. Another example, uh, our current Lawn to Meadow program coordinator, Lily, who you'll see some more pictures of, and Lily also took most of the great pictures that you're going to see today. Uh, Lily um, is our coordinator. And among the things that they do is Lily has put together 
a whole series of videos on YouTube on how to make a meadow, really going through every step, all of the important things that landowners ask us about, and all of the important things they don't know to ask us about. Uh, it's still in process. I think there's four episodes out and many other episodes on specific topics, but trying to give you a full series on how to think through this process from conceiving the idea to managing your established meadow. And again, there's lots of QR codes where you can access this uh information and we're on social media i uh again our talented students put this together so if you want tons of information about plants and meadows and how to create them how to manage them please check out these resources many other students who have worked for us i i don't do this alone this is as don said we have an army of students that we train to do this work and this is what we do with all of the money that we get from folks like sla we train the next generation of conservation practitioners uh so shu on the left uh completing her phd soon um created a wonderful guide for us and managed social media jess proctor who is now working with us again part-time on meadow work while she finishes her grad work andrea smith who's worked for both the rsc and the skinny atlas lake association and of course lily who i just introduced who's very photogenic I've already said the word meadow many times. I should probably define what I'm speaking about. So a meadow is a very basic uh, kind of vague ecological term. It's, it's not as specific as many of our science terms tend to be. It's a plant community of grasses and grass-like species, uh, taxa like sedges and flowers, few to no woody species. Uh, when you hear the word meadow, you often think there, there's more flowers than grasses. When you hear the word grassland, you think more grasses than flowers. It's it's somewhat of a loose term the way I'm using meadows. Uh, but really, it's a it's an herbaceous plant community with lots of flowers and, and grasses. The reason that we're so interested in meadows, and not just here, but all over the country, this is uh, a very, uh, very uh, timely issue is we are recognizing the harm that lawns can cause. And look, I, <clears throat> I'm i not going to say everyone has to get rid of their lawn and you should go out and yell at your neighbors, but we should think about what lawns represent in terms of lost habitat. Um, I, of course, we know the issues of lawns being associated with water quality problems. So uh, people that use fertilizers or pesticides incorrectly or too much or even in the wrong conditions like prior to a, an extreme rainstorm these issues can lead to contamination in our water which can lead to issues like harmful algal blooms and and all that but we understand that and most of us don't manage our lawns with these these chemicals at least those of us who are quite responsible around skinny atlas lake but lawns still represent a big ecological problem one of them, and this is the one of great interest to me as a conservation biologist, is that they represent an enormous loss of habitat. Uh, there is more lawn in the lower 48 states than there is national park in that area. Lawns make up about 2% of the conterminous U.S. So to me, that is incredible real estate for restoring functional quality habitat to meet objectives like protecting water and to sustain the biodiversity we care about but like pollinators and all of the other invertebrates that are the most important organisms to keep our society running and lawns uh you know they're kind of a biological wasteland uh, they're useful for playing sports for having a picnic but in terms of providing ecosystem function, doing the things that nature does for free to help us lead better, cheaper lives, lawns don't do too much. They are a sink of materials and can be very expensive to manage. So, so this is why a lot of folks are interested in this lawn to meadow concept. And so we're in no mo May. Why not just stop mowing your lawn? Now, I'm not knocking no mo May. Um, I think it is a great thing, but I think it's kind of a first step. And my response to why not just stop mowing your lawn would be, well, lawns tend to be dominated by non-native grasses and some forbs. They are also tend to be non-native and they don't provide nearly the ecosystem benefits or the biodiversity value that a native assemblage of plants would. So here's a great illustration of that. And by the way, I didn't make this image. Uh, this has been around for a while, a very famous image showing the above and below ground biomass 
of plants that are common in meadows. And you can see there that many of these species, um, the uh, silphium, the cup plant on the left, um, some of the blazing star liatris on the right, have roots that go down as far as you know, 14, 15 feet deep in the soil, where soil allows, of course. And if you look on the far left, I've just highlighted it in red, that's good old Kentucky bluegrass, a common, uh, a common complex of long grasses that are used. And if you look, this, this is bluegrass that's been cut, so it's only at a few inches, as you would expect in a lawn. Below grounds, the roots reflect that. There's very little going on underground, so you don't have this complex root zone in the soil that supports a thriving and diverse soil biota. And these are the organisms that improve soil fertility, that help sequester carbon, and do all of these important things to um, add to our lives and protect against issues like climate change. So I, I'd like to show you some photos of meadows rather than just rambling on about statistics. And I would like to show you some um, through time. So right now we're just getting to the stage. So this photo was taken in Pennsylvania. I'm gonna show you a couple mature meadows before we get into the ones that we've been creating around here. Uh, this is a, a common combination of using spiderworts and penstemons that looks like penstemon digitalis, the white flowers, and the spiderworts I would guess are Ohio, the purple flowers. Just a beautiful combination of early flowering plants. And if you were to zoom in, you can see species like this bumblebee here. And if our pollinator ecologist Molly Jacobson were around, she could tell you exactly what species it is and probably even when it, where it went to college. She's amazing. And you can see that as you zoom into these closer and closer scales, the life is so abundant in these habitats compared to a lawn. Uh, just another perspective of the same meadow at a different time of year, just showing the diversity of coverage that you can get based on the plants that you choose. And now in July, a very different look, quite different in terms of color. You see some red. Those are seed heads of what looks like an agrostis grass, one of the bent grasses. I would guess autumn bent grass. Um, we see some white swaths in the back. That looks like the seed heads of a, a mountain mint, one of the pycnanthemums, a beautiful fragrant mint that supports a really high diversity of pollinators and crop pest predators, those little bugs that protect our food from the worms that eat it. And of course, zooming in, we see all these complexities of structure. So a lawn is just a flat plane, very sterile, but here there's so much diversity in terms of how the plants are shaped and how they, they are arranged with each other that creates all of these little microclimates and habitats for invertebrates and the songbirds and little mammals that eat them. Here we have some Culver's root and I can count at least three bumblebees uh, just just thriving with life. And this is why we do what we do. Um, lawns cannot support this. So it's not just that we're using meadows in a strategic way to protect water quality by, absorb by uh, transpiring more water off the land, slowing the flow of erosion, and uh, generally improving the quality of soil to help with infiltration. It's also to support biodiversity. And this is what you don't get with engineering. This is what you get with wise use of ecological knowledge. And just zooming in more to, we have a common milkweed here. Uh, this plant will be blooming uh, it, it, later in summer. This is from last year. And it's covered in little ants that are probably farming aphids or something like that. Very complex interactions. And um, these systems are, I think, just as beautiful, if not more so, in the cold months. So this is that same meadow now in September. And you can see it almost looks like it's reflecting the foliage of the fall trees back at it. And compared to a, a flat lawn, I think this is a very attractive alternative. Um, still relatively low growing. I mean, obviously you can't have a picnic here, but you know, it's waist height. You can see over it. Um, those of you who have little kids or educators like me, these are phenomenal tools to teach about plant community dynamics and about ecology. Uh, for a little kid, even for an adult, it's tough to wrap your mind around a forest, right? It's bigger than us spatially. It's bigger than us in terms of time. It, you plant a tree and it won't mature uh, until you're older. But these plant communities can mature in you know, five or six or seven years, and you see them change every day. You see interactions between the plants competing for light and uh, between plants and their insect pollinators, and you can watch it all happen. And many of these plants are 
fragrant. They're wonderful for using in cuisine or just to have around the house to perfume the air. So it's really something that we love people getting into and feeling like they're an active part in the management of these systems, that they really have ownership in it. And in winter as well, um, I'm, I, I'm showing a couple pictures from farther south now. Um, we don't have as much broom sedge, which is the brownish grass that you're seeing in the meadows that we use up here. Um, and really, these can be remarkable landscape features in terms of their beauty. Um, beauty is, of course, in the eye of the beholder, but that's what we help landowners do. Um, it, it, look, the function always comes first. We know that's the case, but we also know that landowners have neighbors and neighbors sometimes complain. So we help folks when they want to do the right thing. We help them make it look the way we they want it to using our knowledge of plants and how they perform together. And just again, like they can be these species even used singly like this planting here can be very attractive as landscape features and perform so much function. The roots of these grasses extend probably 10 feet into the soil at the site. And finally, just, you know, in winter, again, I think very attractive features that um, far more so than a lawn, there's always something interesting to look at. And what's more so, um, in this meadow, it looks dead, it looks dry. All of these plants are dormant for the winter, but they are almost certainly full of invertebrates and small vertebrates like songbirds um, that shelter in them. And without the presence of this material, we cannot sustain many of these populations in a landscape. So don't think of meadows as just the food in the growing season for butterflies and bees that you like to come and eat. They're also a home, they're overwintering san sanctuary that can protect these animals and allow them to persist on your land and in the landscape. So let's look at some of the meadows we've created around here. Um, many of them are still young, just a few years old. And like any thing, um, sometimes there's growing pains. Um, I often tell landowners that the first couple of years, you might get mad at me when I help you make a meadow because they go through these spurts of growth where we we um, use certain plants that we know grow faster to provide immediate color and provide shelter for the slower growing seedlings of the longer lived perennial plants. So they have just enough shade to protect them from drought, just enough sun. It's a, it's a phased sort of transition. And um, I think that these are, are absolutely beautiful systems at all times, but uh, we're very careful to help folks understand how these things will look. Uh, maybe in a given month, they might look a little brown, but trust us, that's part of the process. So this is actually my backyard. Um, I make so many meadows for folks that I wanted my backyard meadow to be very quiet and very, um, I don't think drab is the right word, but not as showy as the, the flowery meadows that I make for a lot of folks. Uh, I wanted things to be green and soft and quiet and really more about the foliage. I only wanted three colors of flower, white, yellow, and pinkish purple, which you'll see photos of. So let's look at some other meadows. Uh, this is our first demonstration site at Go Native Perennials in Skinny Atlas. And this is a site that um, had been under tarp for a while because um, Janice, who isn't pictured, and Mary, who is on the right, uh, were planning to do something with it. And they were ecstatic about the idea of having a meadow. And so we, we planted this site. Um, the smothering there, what it did was it it prevented other plants from growing. So that tarp had been on there from a couple of year for a couple of years, and any plants that were under there when the tarp was put over them can no longer photosynthesize, so they starve. And you can see anywhere there's a tear, there's a little puff of grass coming up. Uh, so this is one of the techniques that people use on very small sites like this one to clear vegetation. Here it is after planting it the following uh, the following spring. And notice it looks a little rough at this stage. It's still very young. These are long lived plants. Um, some of them like big blue stem can live over a century. Um, so these plants take a little time to come online. So uh, it looks perhaps a little messy there, but here it is last year after just a year of growth and it's starting to look like it should when it's mature. Uh, beautiful uh, pink. We have uh, those, those pinkish purple flowers are Minarda fistulosa bee balm. Then there's purple cone flower, lots of black eyed Susan, some um, oh, some flea banes, uh, some 
some Queen Anne's lace. Uh, many of these are volunteer plants that show up on their own. And I'll talk about that at the end. You know, what is a weed? Here's another site. This is at uh, the east side of the lake at a property called The Colony. And what was formerly Lawn, uh, working with the landowners there who were the people who really kicked off this effort. I, I don't want to make them blush if they're listening, but we owe a lot of this to these folks who were so interested in doing this and came to ESF for this guidance. And here we see the lawn that was, and then right after planting it with a cover crop of oats, and then uh, after a year of growth, this is its second growing season. So you can see there are just beginning to be so, uh, there are just beginning to be some landsleaf coreopsis opening. Those are the yellow flowers. Interestingly, not a plant considered native to New York, but just so. It is a native to North America, but it's an example of how we creatively use these species that are predicted to be here with moving plants and climate change and things like that. So you can also see there's some uh, brown-eyed Susan and black-eyed Susan that are in the foreground. So here's what this site looks like about a month after this photo was taken. Uh, friends of the landowner were flying over and they noticed all the black-eyed Susans in bloom. The meadow was neon yellow. And they took this photo. It's strange. It's almost exactly the same color as their plane and sent it to the landowners. Um, so the meadow is now uh it's it's getting quite mature um i was there last week and all of the plants have filled out but unfortunately none of them are flowering just yet so i didn't i didn't include any photos of it but this year it will be spectacular uh just to note we also do a lot of smaller scale work uh this is me with my uh one of my classes and um, we're at a church here in Syracuse helping them put in a pollinator garden. You can see the tarps in the background there. I'm also teaching the students how to um, kill invasive trees. Uh, I think we're going to cut down a buckthorn there. But this is the sort of thing we do around the community. We create opportunities for students to contribute directly to their community by restoring it. And that is part of class that trains them how to do this work. And it allows them to work with everyone in their community, not just other college students of the same age and the same economic background and all that, but everybody. It's hands-on restoration for all. Uh, we also work extensively all over the country with solar facility managers. And this is a photo from the Tully um, solar facility. This is about 15 minutes from where I live in Pompey. Uh, just south of Syracuse. So not in Skinny Atlas, but close. And the very first common milkweed that I inspected at this old cornfield had a monarch caterpillar on it. And that's great to see. Um, you know, I'm not going to get into the whole solar issue, but um, many of these denuded agricultural fields that essentially have become sponges for fertilizer and are no longer economically productive and need to recover, we are working with solar facility managers to use these plant communities to not only cut down on the maintenance they have to do, so reduce the mowing, but also enhance the site, like, like greatly building soil organic matter from like 2 to 15 or even 20% over the normal lifespan of a solar lease. So we're not just doing work on people's properties, but it's a very integrated mixed-use landscape perspective. So I want to show uh, a couple examples of how to choose species and how we go about this process. So on the left there, you can see uh, a penstemon flower with a bumblebee, um, her little butt sticking out there of the flower. And I create these meadows to make sure that not only were we meeting our objectives for ecosystem services, but we're also providing an unbroken supply of food and shelter to the animals we want to support. Certain pollinators, like certain flowers. Many bumblebees have long tongues, so do many lepidopterans, like butterflies, such as the monarch. And those uh, pollinators like these long tubular flowers where they can crawl in or use their long mouth parts. So what I do is make sure that there are are all of these flower morphologies present at a given time. So there's always food available for the insects that like to use them. So here's my example. Um, in spring, one of the earliest blooming flowers we typically use in many meadows will be of the penstemons. Uh, Penstemon digitalis, Levigatus, Hirsutus, there's many types. And they, they bloom pretty early. And just as they're finishing blooming, Monarda fistulosa begins to bloom. That's bee balm. And uh, that's definitely not the same bee, but it may be the same species. Um, and it is a similar flower that long-tongued insects really favor. As the bee balm begins to fade for the year, Monarda punctata dotted mitt begins to bloom. 
And so there is an unbroken supply at all times when the growing season is active that these animals have access to the flowers they like. And this is true for other flower morphologies. This is just one example. So this is a just a very brief introduction to how we go about selecting plant species to not just do one thing, but do as many things as we can with these actions of creating meadows on people's land. And I'll just, I'll, I'll wind down here by saying, you know, uh, I, I'm growing um, very defensive of weeds. I, I kind of like weeds. Um, I think that our messaging as conservationists about the importance of using native species is is great. But, um, you know, there are many exotic species that aren't that problematic, many of them that can actually add to a landscape. And I'm saying this because when we help create meadows for folks, often people, um, they get a little scared because they see a plant that wasn't in the seed mix. They're like, oh, should I pull it? It's like, well, why? It's, it's um, one of those things where you get free plants coming in that provide nectar and pollen and hold the ground while the more mature, uh, the longer lived plants begin to mature. So the idea of a weed is very subjective. Let's look at some. Oh, geez, sorry, my computer's slow. So here's an example of a plant that I put in my meadow. We just saw it. This is the beautiful Monarda punctata, dotted mint. I wanted it in the meadow in my backyard, so I bought seed for it. I didn't buy seed for this plant, bone set, because I knew it was growing in the woods, right or on the edge of the woods, right next to where I wanted to put my meadow. So I knew there'd be seeds in the soil, and it came up just as I expected. And this is common mullen, a plant that you probably see a lot driving around on highways on the side of the road. Um, a gorgeous plant, in my opinion, that I think a lot of people would consider ugly, but I know what it does, and I like it for those reasons. It is a non-native biennial, so the first year, year you get a, a rosette of very soft leaves, and the second year you get this stalk of flowers. And the reason I like it is that I've never found it becoming too um, competitive in a meadow where it grows so densely that it can outcompete the desired plants that you've paid a lot of money for. Uh, and where it is studied in the mid-Atlantic, common mullen is one of the most important pollen sources to feed bumblebees, including some of the rarest bumblebees in the warmest months of the summer when many of the native plants aren't producing as much nectar or pollen. And when it forms seeds, Goldfinches especially, and many other birds love the seeds of this plant. Um, many other features, I mean, it's a robust stem, so it's a good perch for raptors and other birds that are larger. Um, so this is how I see uh, the issue of exotic plants in meadows. Uh, it's a very nuanced perspective, and I hope someday the public also gets to that perspective where, you know, we, we're we devote a lot of effort to suppressing the species that are known to be bad and we stop spreading things that aren't native, but we have a more um, uh, perhaps thoughtful perspective on things that are already in the landscape and perhaps can manage them for a more productive relationship with our native plants. Uh, just a couple design thoughts for you all and an opportunity to show a couple more pictures as I end here. Um, in areas where there's lots of folks, design is essential. And um, we can talk at the end about issues like vegetation height restriction, but here's some, some tricks. Um, putting paths through a larger meadow, very helpful. Having nice sharp borders, also very helpful. It makes your work look intentional, not like you just stop mowing your lawn. Here's just a couple examples of how that can be done working with the landscape. I didn't create any of these paths. I am clueless with design work. I'm just lucky enough to work with some landscape architects, so I've picked up some of their lingo. But designing things in such a way can create the illusion of more space, um, the illusion of distance. It's a really, it's a really cool concept that I wish I were better at. And to end, just a couple of things: uh, the myths, pests like ticks and snakes. So um, more pests in your home. Here's a cute little bunny that lives in my backyard. Um, I have not been able to find any published research where creating meadows in a landscape absolutely leads to more pests in homes. Um, I know that's a very complicated concept and you know how people measure that is in question, but what meadows tend to do is support a higher diversity of mammals, not necessarily the mammals like paramiscus mice, the deer mouse, the white-footed mouse, and the invasive house mouse that want to get in your home. All the, the mice that want to get in your home are going to be in your home already. Uh, meadows support other things like voles and shrews and animals that are less inclined to want to go in your home. What about ticks? Um, 
I have been studying ticks in meadows and adjacent areas like this unmowed pasture here, which is like what your lawn would look like if you didn't mow it for 13 years. And I work with Dr. Brian Ledet, one of the world's foremost zoonotic disease researchers who works all over the world, including in some of the sites I study. Uh, we do not find more ticks in meadows, uh, specifically the ticks that give you the worst diseases, like the deer tick, for example. Um, that's the one that gives you Lyme disease, Ixodes scapularis. And those ticks tend to be in more humid areas, like in a forest or in scrubby areas on the edge. Um, can they be in meadows? Yes. Do you get lots more in meadows than you would in a pasture like this? No. And the reason for that is likely that there is a complex ecology of life in meadows, things that can eat the ticks, things that can um, be parasitized by the ticks. So it's not you that walks by when nothing else is available for the ticks to parasitize. Uh, it's also in how the meadows are managed through, through um, in other areas of the country, through fire that may have a role in suppressing ticks, but that's really not well understood. So the point is, you're not going to get more ticks if you have a meadow. Could you possibly get more in isolated situations? Sure, there's always exceptions to the rule, but by and large, that's just not the case. And finally, cost. Um, I hear a lot about how meadows are cheaper to manage than lawns, and that can absolutely be true, but it doesn't necessarily always have to be true. Um, you have to think about the common sense issues of how much you, you pay for lawn care, you know, how much do you mow it, what does that cost, versus the capital investment costs of buying meadow seed and clearing your lawn and, and having someone plant the seeds. So that's how we make these measurements. Typically, meadows in the long term are cheaper to manage than a lawn, but again, it depends on what you're looking for, the type of plant community, and the way you want it to look. So I know I went a couple minutes over. Sorry about that. I talk about this stuff all day, and I can do it uh, all day. So I just wanted to end here with some information for you all. You can check out all of our work online on our website, on our social media, and if you have questions... Uh, that we don't get to today, please contact Lily Kramer, our Meadow Program Coordinator, and Jess Proctor, uh, who is, again, assisting with her Meadow work and tons of other RSC business. Jess is like a whiz kid as she finishes up her graduate degree. And if you're interested in supporting our work, not just Meadows, but anything at the RSC, um, you know, visit our website and you can talk to us about that too. All of this is because of philanthropy from folks like you. That's how we train all these students. And uh, it's just really fun to be a part of. So. I will end there, and it was a pleasure to get to speak to all of you today. Thanks so much, Sam uh, and Don. I really appreciate your overview of the Restoration Science Center and sharing all this exciting work and new updates and, and certainly some photos I, I haven't seen yet that were uh, wonderful to see of the uh, flowers and meadows uh, happening. I, I see we've got a few questions coming in. Um, a little bit, but please, uh, if folks have questions to add into the, the Q&A. Um, I do see the first question was in regards to, I guess, prepping uh, prepping your, your lawn or to make the transition. And I think it was in regards to some of the, uh, well, I think maybe the photos with the demonstration sites and maybe the school groups showing the, the tarping, if someone doesn't have, doesn't want to do that much tarping, what what are some of the, the methods in, in transitioning a lawn? And I guess that question's for you, Sam. Sure, um, so I'll, I'll also point you to um, our YouTube videos where that's one of the topics. We go through all these methods and um, we, we have a conversation about it. Um, but there's a few main methods that are specific to lawns that are appropriate. One of them is tarping, but as you get over about a thousand square feet, it becomes very impractical. Deer can step on the tarp, it can blow away. Um, it's it's a lot more work than it seems. There's soil disturbance that's tilling a site over and over again, usually at least two or three times. So uh, that rips up the existing lawn, grasses, and forbs. Uh, it dries out the roots. They die. Some of them reroot. You dredge up seeds from the soil. They germinate. You have to till again. And in that process, you're destroying uh, soil structure, or at least changing it. Um, and it takes time for that to recover. There's also scouring, which is um, removing some of the soil. Uh, you can do a light scour using an implement like a turf cutter, for example, which is something you can even rent and learn how to use. So imagine cutting strips of maybe the top two to three inches of soil with the sod and rolling them up, 
and carting them away. The cutting's the easy part. It's what you do with all the turf you cut that's complicated and people realize at the end. And then there's, of course, herbicides. Um, I talk landowners through all of these methods. Um, uh, you know, herbicides can be a scary concept, but often compared to the other techniques available are the least harmful. I know that sounds counterintuitive, but the least harmful to the ecology of the site in terms of destroying soil structure, killing soil organisms through the disturbance and the recovery time that it takes. Um, so the landowners that have chosen to use herbicides, we've put them together, we have put them with professionals who are licensed applicators, and we insist they only use, even if they're not anywhere near a sensitive area, they only use like wetland safe herbicides just for that extra level of care. So those are the really the four main areas that are appropriate for lawn. Great, thanks, Sam. Um, and then, uh, do we have any more questions, Molly? You see. Yep, there's just one more in there. And it says, what is the general amount of time to convert a traditional grass lawn to a meadow if you were to put a timeline on it? So it depends on the technique you use to remove the lawn. Um, if you were to use a turf cutter and you strip away the sod, you could literally plant a meadow right after that. If you were to use uh, soil tilling, typically what that involves in central New York, depending on the species in your lawn and in the weed seed bank in the soil, all the little nasty weeds waiting to germinate, that can involve tilling um, from late April every month until October in an extreme case, or just tilling a couple times. Um, but if you're doing any sort of soil disturbance, if you're doing any sort of tarping, if you're doing any sort of herbiciding, it's a usually at least a year of prep time. And the reason for that is you need multiple tillings or applications because different plants grow and germinate at different times of the year. So let's say you were to use an herbicide and you were to spray your lawn at this time of year. Great, you kill a bunch of stuff that's there, but a lot more things will germinate later in the year that wouldn't be active now. Um, so you'd have to address that as well. Um, so typically it's about a year, but it depends on your establishment method. Um, I know some folks in certain areas where they have a seed bank of great native species that would be in meadows and they tilled once and stuff comes up. That's extremely rare. Um, usually in our very disturbed landscape, we need to do a good job to sterilize uh, the lawn to remove it and remove the weeds that are waiting that are that are mowing suppress and then once it's fully sterilized um, we can establish the meadow it's much harder to establish a meadow and then pick out all the nasty weeds from the good plants than it is to get rid of the good plants at the beginning put work in at the outset you'll be happier and Norway maple is a weed I saw that, <laughs> yeah, that very much so fun. yeah yes <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. There's um, one more question in here. Um, uh, so oh, there's someone a lot of questions. <laughs> oh, yeah. Actually, mine are just loading in. So um, there's one here that there's a better growing milkweed other than the common milkweed. Is that right? And I guess you have information on that. Better growing, huh? Well, <laughs> Um, it, it depends, and Don can speak much more on this, but I'll just briefly say there's common milkweed. It's a beautiful plant for average to slightly wet sites. There's butterfly milkweed if you have a very dry, gravelly site, which many of our lawns are. There's swamp milkweed for wetter areas. There's poke milkweed and, and others for shady areas. But I mean, that's just scratching the surface. I don't know if Don wants to say any other milkweeds that I totally forgot about, but... Well so there, there's actually 16 milkweeds native to New York, and they're all best under conditions that support that species. So for old fields, the common milkweed is, is best. If, if it's a real wet meadow, the swamp milkweed is just really amazing. If you want the, um, the one that people call plyweed, uh, you really have to grow it in gravel. So the thing is, is to always understand what your basic soil conditions are. And instead of um, trying to force a species into that site, understand the site, and that site will then tell you what the what, what best species is. And then you, you have so much less work to do if you match the species to the site instead of the other way around. Yeah, I'll, I'll second that. Sometimes folks want something they've seen, but you look at their site and it's just like, there's no way you can do this. Um, 
uh, I'll add that meadow vegetation tends to grow fairly well on quite poor soil. And that's often ideal because um, it's harder for many of the worst invasive species to colonize a poor site compared to a disturbed rich site. So I've had people like, oh, we should add fertilizer. And I, no, don't, don't leave it poor. Spend as little money as possible on repairing the site and you'll be happier. And, and I, I do see there is in the, the, the chat that came through and, and another question, I think they're uh, similar. It says, is there a minimum area for a meadow? But then also there's a question that says, have you installed a small meadow by a dwelling, say like 30 by 100 uh, square feet or 30 by 100 feet? Sorry, uh, uh, there's a lawn there now. So I guess it's the question of minimum meadow size and have you done small meadows? Yeah, so, and I'll, um, I'll again point you, I don't know if this video is out yet, but it'll be the next one if it's not out yet, but we discuss exactly this issue of size in one of these YouTube videos and um, use some cool ESF technology that I just learned about to explain it, so check it out. Um, it's, there, I would say a minimum size is more about the, um, the cost than anything um, ecological. Obviously at a minimum size, you can start planting plants with plugs rather than using seed, which is typically what we do for a meadow above like a couple hundred square feet. So imagine if you want a relatively dense meadow and you need two or three plants per square foot and you go to a nursery and plants in you know small pots are you know 10 bucks each. So that's maybe 30 bucks a square foot. Uh, you can see the economy of scale starting to shape up where um, seeds make a lot more sense, you know, for a, a couple thousand square feet, your average seed mix that you would develop is maybe a pound per 2000 square feet. And a pound might cost anywhere from like, you know, 35 to $75. Compare that to planting individual plants. So the issue of size ecologically, though, is a very important question. Um, it, surface area is very important. So if you have a big blocky meadow, that will be more self-sustaining than a long narrow meadow because weeds and unwanted species push in from the sides. Um, so surface area is a big, uh, I see that like 30 by 100 foot question. Um, that would certainly be a, a good meadow. Um, that's, that's large enough to be self-sustaining for many years. Um, and these are sustaining systems. Um, managing a meadow in central New York is really just fighting woody succession. It's keeping out um, woody species that colonize by clipping them every year or so. And, and um, occasionally there will be certain very bad invasive plants. Um, the ones that we deal with a lot around here, uh, the herbaceous species anywhere, things like mugwort uh, and crown vetch, which are very, very aggressive plants that are great for erosion control, but have gotten out of hand. So, um, yep. Yep. So no minimum size. Uh, I would say anything smaller than like 100 square feet, though, is going to be so invaded that it's it's going to be a lot of work for you to weed all the time. Um, these plants are great for resisting um, or, or for outcompeting other plants long term. But even on even stuff like the big grasses, you'll have to do some weeding at those small scales. I would maybe then consider like a shrub planting to benefit pollinators in spring or using any number of like a formal, uh, any number of native flowers and grasses in a more formal planting design. It might work better for you. All right. Uh, we've got quite, yeah, I think we've got a, a few more. Uh, what's, what's the next one in the queue, Molly? I lost, I lost track. <laughs> I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> um, so next up we have, do meadows have to be on flat areas or can they be on hillsides? And yeah, uh, so mostly that about that. Answer. I'd say that, okay, so this this is a great question. Um, three to one slopes, after steeper than three to one starts getting tricky in terms of um, how well the vegetation will hold. So we would, in those cases, mix in lots of rhizomatous species. These are species that form mats on the soil. They spread through these, um, uh, you know, like underground runners that can hold the soil. So many of the mints do this, certain grasses, like some of the bent grasses do this. Um, I would lean towards uh, keeping meadows on sites that aren't terribly steep. I would say more than a three to one slope, you're getting into a situation where I think 
more substantial erosion control engineering type devices would be necessary to make sure that vegetation establishes. You may even mix in um, some non-native vegetation that is well understood. Some of the fescues that um, just clump up and don't form mats may be a component of that meadow to help prevent erosion, but in that context, that non-native plant won't be harmful the way it would be in a monoculture. So those are some of the techniques we would use. And I'm just going to, I'm going to interject. I know we've got a couple. I did want to had a specific question for Don on a little bit of the, I know you've done some past studies for, I think, related to Onondaga Lake cleanup uh, when they decided to do meadows in the, uh, for the settlement basins. And there was some uh, research and numbers done related to evapotranspiration values. And I was just thinking about uh, what what meadows can do for uh, I guess uh, helping with with uh, with soil moisture and and if maybe it's uh, reducing uh, that soil moisture load that can lead to runoff and uh, you know when when our when things get saturated and may, maybe I'm off but I think there was something related to the evapotranspiration. Well, so the. The goal is to keep water moving nutrients and pesticides and herbicides into the lake. And the way, best way to do that is to have vegetation that there's no water left to run off now. You can create a system, if you're really, really successful, that's really dry, really dry out the site. But if you think about the basic hydrologic model for central New York, we get about 39 inches of precip into central New York in snow and rain. A lot of these plants in a community use one, use up to three meters of water in evapotranspiration during the year. So that's three times the amount that's coming in. And so there shouldn't be any runoff. And that's what we did on the waste beds is we were trying to come up with a system and, and the alternative was to plant non-native willows. We do have the data, this paper's in review, that shows that our complex, diverse structure uses as much uh, water through evapotranspiration as these massive willows that look like they're just so much more effective. So for ecological function, you wanna maximize structure and diversity. Great, thanks, thanks, Don. Um, and I, I apologize for interjecting a, a question when uh, I think there's some, certainly some others. Uh, I know we're a little after eight o'clock and I, uh, Don and uh, Sam uh, kindly offered to stay, stay around a few extra minutes if we had uh, more questions running in, and we certainly do. Uh, where are we, are we at the how long for the tarping method was? Uh, yeah, or did yeah. We, yeah. Yeah, okay. That's where yeah. we left off. Great. Well, so so quickly on that, um, obnoxiously, all those answers begin with it depends. It depends on how warm it is, depends on what the plants are under there. I would say generally what you want to do is put a tarp on it starting, you know, a little before right now, because there's there's weeds. Uh, I keep using the word weeds. Certain winter winter plants that you may not desire in your meadow that are already flowering. Um, Normally what you do is you keep the tarp on for maybe three weeks, then you check it. Um, when it looks like a lot of stuff has died, maybe take it off for a bit and allow more soil to germinate. If it's a small area and you have the time, maybe give it a scratch with a hard rake to disturb a bit of the very top layer of the soil. You don't have to really rough it up, but that'll uh, maybe kick up some of the weeds in the seed bank that'll germinate. And you can exhaust those by letting them germinate, letting them get some rain on them and stuff. Um, by the way, if you use a tarp, please use a, a permeable fabric, like a landscape fabric. Um, otherwise you're, you're not allowing any water to get in, you're interfering with gas exchange. But normally it's a process of you tarp it, you allow things to die, you allow new things to regrow and to germinate, you kill them again, and it goes on throughout the summer. So I would say you're looking at a summer of doing the tarping method. Farther south, you can get away with less time because it's a lot hotter. Great. Thanks, Sam. I think that in the next question we have is related to uh, when things get overgrown or the maintenance. Uh, so it's 
Uh, someone mentioned that they have an old meadow that's been taken over mm -hmm. by invasives, poison ivy, and uh, you know, at, at asking about the field mowing. Um, and then it also brings up, uh, you know, how once you restore a meadow, how often do you have to mow it and when, if at all? So I, is that like every three year brush hogging? I was going to kind of ask sure. the question of, and and I know others I've talked to about this are interested in once you decide I'm, I want a meadow, I've got a meadow, what's that maintenance commitment uh, down the line? Maybe, maybe it depends again. Um, yeah. But, but that's yeah. a good like cost benefit of am I mowing every, you know, once a week and, and gas and time as it's opposed to like brush hogging every three years, you know? Okay. So, so about the poison ivy, um, mowing a meadow the way you would mow a meadow will not kill poison ivy in that context. Um, to kill the poison ivy, you're going to have to mow it really low and frequently, so low that you're going to begin harming meadow species. Um, many of the larger grasses that you might use in a meadow, including big blue stem or uh, Indian grass, we're used to grasses, or, or many of our long grasses or exotic cool season grasses that grow in the colder times of year, their growth points are basically at the soil surface. The more active growth points for some of these larger grasses that get like seven feet tall or even just three or four feet tall are off the ground a couple inches. So you can actually damage them by mowing them too frequently. Um, I, I got to tell you, this is actually one of those cases where if you can't live with the poison ivy, and I'm hyper allergic to it, so I feel you, if you can't live with it, yeah. this is one of those situations where you may actually want to consider a targeted herbicide use of something like a, a broadleaf specific herbicide that won't harm grasses. But again, I, I wouldn't recommend that unless I saw your site, but it's something you may want to think about as a less disturbed uh, a method that will cause less disturbance and strategically remove species. But but that's a really loaded, you know, answer. So I, I wouldn't recommend anything. And it's something that you should talk to a professional about or me separately. I can give you some ideas to follow up on. But um, mowing it. So again, maintaining these open systems, it's weird to think that we're conserving animals like grasshopper sparrow and other grassland birds that are part of the Eastern US largely because of the actions of native peoples that maintained open areas. It's not natural to have many of the open areas that we are used to as meadow um, in the East. Um, in the Midwest, the Great Plains, those areas are naturally grasslands, prairies, but here, so much of it's complicated by the actions of people that manage this land to maintain these open areas and now animals depend on them. So they manage land with how I would prefer to manage meadows with fire. I'm a fire manager, can't really do that and like skinny atlas. Um, I also graze animals. Uh, we use cows to replicate the action of bison, which is what native peoples did. And they got very, very good vegetation responses by timing things just right to maybe um, make sure the grasses were really nutritious. So the buffalo would want to eat those first and leave the flowers and you get more flowers the next year. So what we do now is really just cutting. Um, cutting replicates that action. And it depends on the meadow. Um, once it's established, uh, you really don't need to cut it more than every maybe like three years. The meadows that most folks around here would do are so small that you can go in with hand pruners in winter when all of the woody stems are exposed and clip out what you don't like. And if you don't want to do that every year, um, you know, you can dab a drop of herbicide on there, um, like a glyphosate you could get at a Home Depot. But, you know, some of these meadows are so small, it's just like every year you spend half an hour clipping plants out. Uh, in establishment years, sometimes you would mow a meadow uh, fully more completely like in a uh, before the winter and it's just for establishment near purposes um so yeah it's it, again it depends but compared to mowing your lawn every 10 days to two weeks uh it's much less mowing okay thanks thanks sam i the next question i'm trying to interpret it looks like I think don uh, could answer that one even better than me oh for the transition uh yeah talking about i get the if it transitions or includes like a taper to like a shrub scrub habitat in the forest? Well, I think he's also asking what's most appropriate in the Finger Lakes region. Yeah. I think Don would have a much better idea in those assemblages. Yeah, it talks about metal transition to partially forested or shrub tree. Maybe that's shrub scrub in a meadow. Pro it, it maybe is a meadow appropriate for the Finger Lakes or in a meadow appropriate. Um, 
Well, so, I mean, I can, I can start on that in terms of that. So basically what this question is getting at is, is uh, plant succession. So you have an open area dominated by herbaceous species and woodies begin to invade. They grow larger. They eventually shade things out and begin spreading. Um, and you get a young or, or a, like an old field with, you know, tougher, more robust, maybe Canada goldenrod type plants, maybe joe pies that overshadow a lot of the shorter meadow species that people tend to like. Uh, in, near their homes, um, then you would get rubuses, the, the blackberries and raspberries, and some of the early colonizer trees like ash and black cherry and a number of others. And um, those young forests are very, very important habitat for many species. Uh, for woodcock, if you enjoy their delightful displays, um, grouse will use those areas for part of their life history. Um, many, many of the birds specifically that you would want to manage for it to enhance on your land. Um, this is a general rule of thumb, very general. I know Frank is probably going to roll his eyes, but very general, Frank. I know you're the bird expert. Um, usually birds that live in early oh, uh, young forests like shrublands or, or early successional forests need less space than birds that live in grasslands. So compare the 30 to 50 acres a grasshopper sparrow needs to maybe like, you know, 20 acres for bobwhite quail a little farther south of shrubland for that part of their habitat need. Y you can get away with a little less land. So um, right. young forests are excellent habitat. I mean, I, I don't want people to think it's like meadows are nothing. Meadows are great because they're like lawns and we can replace part of lawns with those. But, you know, where there's forests, there should be forests. Where there's wetlands, there should be wetlands and there could be wet meadows too. Um, lawns just tend to be dry. That's why I stuck to the uplands. <laughs> Yeah, I think from our our standpoint, the the more root structure and things to help help is is uh, certainly the uh, the goal uh, for this. But for those that are looking for broken views, uh, not clear cutting and having a full lawn uh, by the shores, but uh, you know encouraging broken views and uh, in areas, and then some may not want to transition their entire lawn, and and maybe you would look at uh you you've got a great uh meadow area and then it does taper you've added some more buffer zones by your shorelines uh, that's a great you know, point I, use, and use we, we've seen some good yeah, yeah good potpourri do. where even i think one of the properties you showed dan or i'm sorry <laughs> sam but i showed um, dan so that's yeah, why yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. <laughs> um yeah. where it had the meadows but then there was some uh some buffer uh type plantings right before exactly. it hit a steep slope so there's all different it depends on on the property i think that's the next question is uh someone's mentioning they have a uh, a home near carpenter's falls and i hate to tell you zone. but yeah how do i suggest well oh to get started on a meadow plan here i i can mm -hmm. actually answer this with a clear yeah. answer um Thanks, you need to think really really hard about why you're doing it what are your objectives? Is it, I want to support pollinators? Is it, well, great, which ones? And we can help you get exactly the species that might benefit certain ones the most based on when they flower. Um, do you want to protect water quality? Um, well, great, we would use certain species that transpire a lot or hold soil. Um, what do you want it to look like? And you know what's what's really funny is uh so I often say like the the ecology part of meadow restoration that's the easy part it's the people expectation part so often I I work with families and then 20 minutes into talking to them I realize that they all have different ideas on what they wanted so the first step is really understand what you want in terms of what you're trying to achieve how much money you're willing to spend at the outset you'll uh, I hope save money in the long term and what you want it to look like how much do you want to be involved in it? Do you just want it to be there and be self-sustaining? Or do you want it to be like kind of a garden too that you can actively participate in the management of? That's really the first step. The next step will be picking out plants that you really like and uh, other things like how tall you want the vegetation to be, um, what your weed issues might be, inspecting the site in that capacity, and then kind of building a budget of how much do you want to spend on supplies and, and that sort of thing. But I, I can't answer like in terms of specifically what plants would work best. You know, we could talk about that separately, but really it's your own expectations. That's what you have to think about. Don, anything to add in regards to just uh, general planning and, and looking at a balance of your property? 
I think Don's internet is messing up. Yeah, might might be a little intermittent. Um, I think we've got two more questions. Uh, one oh. related to tarps, and then the other related to uh, uh, where where to find plants. And I, I yeah, the, the in... oh, now I think you're better, Don. Now, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think um, the rest the restoration science center website that had just the big section on the lawn domestic program, I think really addresses small and large issues. Um, but um, yeah, I th but the connection on the sound video is going in and out here. So it's getting difficult to respond. You want to type in some nurseries that you know? and <laughs> Yeah. I, I, it, I know you know the best ones. Yeah, I, I'm going to actually, I've got queued up uh, that has a, a good smattering. It just came out as the uh, Habitat Gardening in Central New York at the Chapter of Wild Ones. Uh, they have a native plant shopping guide uh, that I just put the link. It includes, I think, even out like White Oak Nursery out in Geneva is in there. Um, some different vendors, uh, Go Native Perennials that uh, mm -hmm. was, was mentioned this evening as part of that guide and uh, has, has a lot of the common and uh, Latin name. Uh, there's actually two guides that you can actually uh, download based on common name or, or Latin, depending on your, your uh, expertise or preference. Um, so that's been a good go-to that I've sent around. Uh, uh, but Sam, I know you work with different seed mix vendors and all that too. Yeah, I can I can list some Don, seed if you have too and, as well. You know, I'll, I'll plug uh, the Plantsman. I was just there Sunday. I'm there a oh, lot. Um, yeah, Amanda's garden's great. Um, so seed though, we're we're often um, looking at seed for making meadows, and um, there's many companies. Uh, there's Roundstone Seed. There's Prairie Moon. Prairie Nursery, similar names, different companies, Pinelands. I work the most with Ernst. I think all of those are great. Um, all of them have advantages. They all know each other. They all have pretty friendly business relationships too. Um, and uh, so the meadows that we've made, um, I think most of them were Ernst Meadows. There's a couple Roundstone Meadows and we often get seeds from Prairie Moon because Prairie Moon is one of the only nurseries that has a good diversity of seeds. They'll sell in sizes smaller than a pound. So that's really nice when we want to put like a dash of something in a seed mix and not have to buy like, you know, 300 bucks worth of that seed and then weigh it out ourselves. Um, so I'll type them into the chat too. So Great. Have them. And, and I, I know we've definitely gone over on, on tonight's time and, and really, oh, there was that, there was the tarp question too. I didn't want yeah. to cut that off. Um, but yeah, go ahead and then uh, happy to. to um, yeah, so. Um, with the tarps, I would say that, um, okay, let me read the question before I answer. Should one should tarp porous fabric? Yes. If you can, um, I would go with a porous fabric. If it's a small enough area, you can even use like cardboard pizza boxes or something if you pin them to the ground so they don't blow away. Landscape staples are great. Sandbags are great. Um, yeah, tarps that aren't porous work. The difference is though, um, I, I am troubled by things that disturb the soil biological community. So if it's non-porous, it's not getting any precipitation. It may be interfering with gas exchange. So that means all those little organisms down there no longer breathe. Um, it, it's, it's so counterintuitive and I'm not trying to like in any way promote herbicides, but it's one of the things that people like, oh, herbicides, they're so terrible, but they'll lean towards one of these other methods and they don't realize that they're actually quite destructive even when done correctly. So um, yes, use a porous fabric when you can. Um, if it's just a small area, consider cardboard because you're just smothering things. Um, I have an area with plastic to kill crown vetch. Let me know how that goes. Uh, <laughs> crown vetch is a, it, man, is that a tough plant? That's one of the ones we're going to send to Mars when we want to colonize there. Um, <laughs> I bet we won't even need oxygen for it to persist there. Well, I guess it wouldn't need oxygen. It'll make some. Um, yeah, I, I bet you can kill crown vetch with a tarp. You can probably kill knotweed with a tarp if you have lots of time and time and time. Um, so yeah, I, I bet it will work. I hope it will be killed in a year. I don't know. It's a very tough plant. Thank, thanks, Sam. Thanks so much. And thanks, Don. Really, really appreciate your time, your involvement. Um, thank, thanks, Molly, for uh, all sticking on with us. Uh, you know, we went late and uh, 
one thing, uh, hopefully, I, I hope everyone has a wonderful Memorial Day weekend. Um, we will try and uh, take some of these links and things and, and maybe put out a, a one pager resource guide of some sort or, or put in an email to those that um, attended this evening and to those that registered and kick that out. Thanks for uh, the folks that stuck stuck along a little longer this evening. Um, but I, this has been really informative, a lot of uh, great resources, great questions, um, and just encourage, I, we put in the chat the, the Regional Watershed Alliance for all the different events, the pledges, uh, but we will send that, that resources out again. Um, and, and thank you so much. Uh, I feel like there's one other thing I wanted to mention, uh, but uh, just all of our host organizations throughout the Finger Lakes that have been working so hard to uh, engage their communities and, and those that are volunteering and volunteering their lands to, to make good choices for our, our waters. Really appreciate that too. Uh, stay in quickly, touch and uh, we'll, we'll get some more, more out to you. Thanks again. I just want to thank you all. Thanks for, thanks for sticking around everybody. It was great. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Molly.